thanks for yeah. contributing with us this morning. Thanks. Galilee, 
and was baptized by John in the Jordan. As Jesus was coming up out of the water, He saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on Him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. At once the Spirit sent him out into the desert. And he was in the desert forty days, being tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and angels attended him. So Jesus, who was without sin, was baptized by John. And it perplexed, perplexed John, who basically said, I should be baptized by you, but as you wish. Nonetheless, John baptized him. And Jesus, why would Jesus need to be baptized? He was without sin, was he not? I believe that Jesus was identifying himself with us with our baptism, with what he was about to do on our behalf. And, uh, and he ties himself to baptism. It's a claim on Jesus' part. And in baptism, we claim Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection as a ransom for sins. And it is the mark of our faith. It is a proclamation and, and it is a proclamation on Jesus' part as well. You'll notice he's questioned directly after this by the old devil. So it is a statement on his behalf. And it's a statement that says his life is not going to be his own. Jesus is God in flesh. He's came down to the earth and he has laid aside certain attributes. Certain attributes. Verse number 11 said... And a voice came from heaven, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. And I hope you realize as you accept Christ as your Lord, you're a child of God as well. This morning, do you believe that you're a child of the living God? It's the last thing that the devil wants you to believe. And I'm sure he toys with every Christian about that from time to time, wouldn't you imagine? And Mark 1 at verse 12 says that once the Spirit sent him into the desert. Now a very strong word here in Greek. The Spirit drove him into the desert. Drove him into the desert. Into the wilderness. And we don't see the fullness of this temptation in the book of Mark. We're going to move over into the book of Luke. Let's turn over to Luke chapter 4 at verse number 1. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the desert, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end he was hungry. I'd say that was probably, probably an understatement, wouldn't you imagine? So Jesus is indeed at his weakest point when the old tempter comes. And sometimes when you're at your weakest point, he'll be there as well. He likes to come at our weakest point. Then he, he sometimes likes to come at our most jovial point, just after we've made a, a statement like this. A statement where we've said we're going to serve him in a new way. We're going to let him have control of some parts and pieces of our lives. A new step. Yeah, he, he likes to show up whenever we're doing anything. Old devil comes when you renew your covenant, when you step out in faith to serve, when God has just affirmed that you are his, ch his child. The devil shows up. And in the wilderness, Jesus is tempted. You know, it's funny, when you think about the wilderness in Scripture, they saw it as a place where devils roamed, you know, and at the same time, the prophets would oftentimes get away from society and go into the wilderness as a preparation for certain ministry. And um, Jesus was fully God and yet fully man. And the Bible says that he was tempted in every way. 
We can't understand that, you know. He was truly fully God and he was truly fully man. And when the Bible says he was tempted in every way, somehow that's correct. By the attributes he laid aside, I guess he gave the old devil the opportunity to toy with his mind and his heart because he was successful at every place we've all failed. The devil said to him, Luke chapter 4, verse number 3. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. If you are the son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Nothing wrong with eating a little bread, is there? But, but, and that's the way the old devil toys with us sometimes, isn't it? Can you justify just about anything you really want? I'm pretty good at it. Nothing wrong with a little bread, but Jesus would have been breaking his fast on the devil's command, basically. He would have also been putting God to the test. And that works in a couple of ways here. Not only can he turn them into bread, but the devil started this question out, if you are the Son of God. And that's an affirmative statement. It'd be like saying, if you are the Son of God, which you most certainly are, then turn these into bread. Still, it's got the seed of doubt there to sow into it. Devil's crafty, crafty. Don't ever forget that. He knows Scripture a whole lot better than any of us do. He likes to twist it, though. He's always done it that way. So break your fast. And another avenue here is use your powers for your own benefit. And that would be totally contrary to everything Jesus has just expressed in this baptism that he's going to die for our sins. He's not going to be using the powers for himself. And I don't think you find in Scripture where he ever did. Can you picture those those rocks, those stones, I've always thought they probably looked an awful lot like a, a loaf of bread to begin with. I can see the rust and the white color, you know. Like a loaf that's just come out of the oven. Turn, turn them into bread. If you're the Son of God. You can do it. Oh, we're talking about a crafty critter here. Yeah, Jesus could have turned those stones into bread. You bet. You bet. Would it be wrong to do so? Yeah, it would have broken his fast. And it would have showed that he was here to use his powers for himself. And when we read about him being in the wilderness and it said among the wild animals, I think that means a whole lot more than what we might imagine as well. And it says, and angels ministered unto him. Ministered unto him. You know, angels will come and minister unto you too when you're having a rough time. I've seen it more times than I could ever imagine. People just show up. You know, the good Lord will send people or he'll send the fence. We all see it. I don't even believe in coincidences, do you? Well... Notice what Jesus uses to rebuke the old devil with. <clears throat> it is the Word of God here at this first temptation. This first te this is the first of three temptations we read about concerning Jesus in the wilderness. And each of the temptations are multi-pronged and they are based around if you are the Son of God. You think back to Eve being tempted in the garden. Satan begins there by questioning the Word of God, doesn't he? Is it not written? You should surely die. And, I, and we'll look at that those verses again one day, but I do hope you always hang on to the fact that Eve had the verses wrong. <coughs> she had added, if we even touch that forbidden fruit, we'll surely die. But that was not correct. That wasn't what God had said. And it makes you kind of wonder if the old devil toss it to her about that time. She knew everything there was to know about it. She'd studied it. It's there in the middle of the garden. And that's the way it is with most things we don't want to get into. 
They're right there in full sight. But I want you to realize the same thing's happening here. The same thing's happening here. A doubt of what God has said. And remember what God proclaimed. This is my son. This is my son. So it is God's word. His physical word. Though we think of God's word as being written down. This too is the word of God. From the heavens above. And the old devil wants to get doubt sown here. This is my son. Jesus' identity as well as God's word are critical to each of the temptations. Jesus is who he said he is and he's dear, here to do what he said he was going to do. And his temptations per parallel Adam and Israel's failures in Scripture. Hang on to that too. As we near Easter, these things all come into view in a strong, a strong way. He is a new Adam. And he is also one greater than Moses. He came back and walked the path of both without sin. He came back and was victorious where they failed miserably, miserably. And I want you to realize here in the wilderness, these 40 days in the wilderness, the temptations mimic where the Israelites failed. And the quotes that Jesus uses to rebuke the devil with are straight from that time period. Straight from the Old Testament and where Israel failed in the Old Testament. So the parallels are, pl are plain. I've often explained it that the New Testament tells us Jesus was baptized in the Jordan. And we read in the Old Testament about Israel crossing the Red Sea. And in the New Testament it says Israel was baptized in the Red Sea and the cloud. So you have Jesus baptized in the Jordan, Israel baptized in the Red Sea. You have Jesus going into the wilderness for 40 days. You have Israel going into the wilderness for 40 years. You see some comparisons there, huh? Yes, indeed. And Jesus was successful where they failed. That's a deep set of thought, isn't it? Deep bunch of thoughts. But he is showing he's successful here. And we're going to begin here with this first temptation. As Eve got that first forbidden fruit, is pleasing to the eye, good for food, desirable for knowledge. It make one like God, knowing the difference between good and evil. Well, there's the sales pitch. That is the trial of temptation in most things. But the ultimate part is doubting God. Down God. Do you trust in Him? It's easy to lose trust at times if we're not careful. When it rains and it pours, is God really watching me? Is He really caring for me? Is he, does He really care? Eve was already a child of God. She had plenty of other food to eat. Yet, her and Adam's hunger for that forbidden fruit must have seemed to strain the soul with hunger pains, don't you suppose? So much, so much so that they were willing to doubt God's Word. Good for food, good for food. Have you ever been really hungry? I bet we all have at one time or another, haven't we? We had a big farm up on Rockwood Mountain that belonged to my grandparents. And after they passed away, I was up there one time and I was starving. I could eat a frozen dog. I was so hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and I got into the, the freezer. The only thing that was up there was a... Uh, Lord, and this was back in the day too. Long, long time ago. It was one of those imitation sausage biscuit. It wasn't even real pork. It was imitation. Now, y'all see them out in the stores today. This was back in yesteryear when they were more an experiment than anything else, okay? <laughs> but I can remember sitting and eating that thing, and I thought it was the best tasting thing I'd ever eaten in my whole life. You know, when we get hungry, we're hungry. Some of us get hungrier than others, I suppose. But um, 
Sometimes we don't even have an appetite to be hungry. Lord of mercy. Sometimes we just decide we want something anyway, don't we? Tell you what, if you want to lose weight, just don't put anything in your refrigerator. You'll go by and shop in there about 50 times a day like I do, but you'll just find carrots or lettuce or whatever somebody decides to stick in there, you know? <laughs> My grandpa, when he was a boy, they were very, very poor. And uh, they lived out in a place called Cold Hill. And his mother had taken him to the store with her, and he's riding in the back of an old truck. They'd loaded up with groceries, and she had bought a banana for him and for each of his brothers. You know, that's about, uh, that's about six of them, I think. It got a 12 brother and sister. But, uh, he ate his banana. And he got to thinking about how he hoped his brother probably wouldn't really appreciate a banana, so he ate his too. <laughs> and he, he decided that his sister probably wouldn't appreciate a banana either, you know. And eventually he'd eaten all their bananas. And uh, they had a belly egg hand whipping on that same day. <laughs> God sent quail to him one time out there, didn't he? Do you remember him complaining against Moses and Aaron? We're going to starve. You've brought us away from all this good stuff in our slavery in Egypt to let us starve. So God sends manna. And then before you know it, they're tired of the manna. They just pretty much lost their appetite. I believe it was part of the complaint. So God sends quail. And with the quail sends a plague. And the verses that Jesus comes back to the old devil with come from right there. You shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word. word of God. Every word. Notice I said we're, we've got identity and word tied together right here. You can trust his promises. You can trust his promises. And I often found it so interesting that as these temptations go on, Right after this, you'll hear the old devil quoting scripture. And if it surprises you that he can quote scripture, don't let it be so, because he can. He certainly can. He's a persuasive preacher. Notice I said preacher. He's not the equal and opposite of God. God has no equal and opposite. Old devil's just another part of creation. He's an angel. And that's it. That's it. But he's a talented one. It says a third of the angels fell with him. He was that persuasive. And he didn't start out as a bad angel. He started out as an angel of light. Perfect in all of his ways. Yet God had allowed the ability for him to fall. And I guess that equals free will. I believe that the old devil had free will. Otherwise he couldn't have fallen, could he? God gives us free will. I've asked him to take mine back a few times. <laughs> yes, he won't though. That's the thing. But you know, when you think about it, if you created something and you can pull a string and it said, I love you, would that really be love? Wouldn't would it? Free will is necessary for us. It's a choice. A bunch of choices in life. And a big test in the midst of it. Are we going to trust Him? We're going to remember who we are or not? You know, when we're tempted, we can get close to Him. We can get into His Word. We can trust Him. We can trust in His Word. We find that we are children of the living God there. How do we see ourselves? You see yourself as a child of God. You know, I read about Christopher Thomas Knight. He's born in Maine and uh, graduated from oh, uh, high school in Fairfield, Maine in 1984. Went to work doing some electronics work. 1986, it's been a lot of years ago, hasn't it? 1986, Knight abandoned his job and drove up to Maine only stopping when his car ran out of gas. And at only 20 years of age, 
He entered into the woods saying goodbye to nobody. He lived in the wilderness alone from 1986 until 2013. 1986 to 2013. And he was caught breaking into uh, some cabins. Is how, is how he was drove back into society. And I think a book came out about him and so many other things. You gotta realize that man, you'd be dealing with some negative 24 degree temperature there. But he had said in his, in his book, a quote from him, he said, solitude bestows an increase in something valuable. My perception. But when I applied my increased perception to myself, I lost my identity. I thought that was a pretty deep statement. You know, it is to say we can see ourselves differently if we get out into the wilderness for a while. We can see life maybe a little bit more in focus. But our identity, who we are, what we do, and what gives us purpose and fullness generally happens in the midst of people. Our identity is something that goes hand in hand with other people. Because not uh, said there was no audience, no one to perform for. How much of your identity is a performance? I guess it's true for everybody to some extent. When there's nobody left to perform for, well, there's always God, isn't there? And that is really the audience of one to whom we ought to be all <clears throat> relating. Part of our identity is tied to our relationship with God and others. Jesus went into the wilderness, as did John the Baptist, but they came back out of the wilderness after spending time alone and related to other people. We are children of God and He will lead us. Romans 8, 14 says, because those who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God, and no doubt daughters of God as well. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear, but you received the spirit of sonship and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. So each of Jesus' temptations begin with, if you are the Son of God, and Jesus responds with God's Word, even if the old devil's trying to twist the Word as well. And the devil starts quoting God's Word, as I said. Maybe, maybe each of our temptations are similar, devil wants you to question who you are, who you are, as well as if you profess Jesus or not. There are two things as we get here to Easter that I want you to always hang on to as we approach the cross. And one is knowing that that was such a temptation or such a part of the temptation, if you are the Son of God, I would remind you that in the New Testament, as Jesus hung there on the cross, there was a voice that came out from the place where the religious elite were located. And that voice said, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. Don't that just kind of give you chills? Who was that? Who was that? And we'll approach those verses once again as we get closer, closer to Easter. There's a second place that stands out to me right there as well. Do you remember the Roman soldier? What he said? After he saw the skies turn black and the earth shake, he proclaimed, surely this was the Son of God. Notice how that is right there in the forefront, even there. And it wasn't the religious elite proclaiming that. It's a pagan Roman soldier. And wouldn't you imagine? That's what Jesus is being crucified for, isn't it? His identity. That he said he was someone else. D 
do you think the old Roman soldier there thought to himself, you know, I'm agreeing with a guy we're crucified over saying this, and I'm saying the same thing. You know, it surely had to have struck his mind that they'd crucify me for this too. But he proclaimed it. This is the Son of God. This is the Son of God. As safe persons, we too have a new identity with which we live in accordance. Will we put our trust in Jesus because of who He is, what He's promised, and thereby who we have become, and are becoming, I should add. You know, that is a little bit of a difference between us and, say, Baptist theology, in that, in that salvation for us is a starting point rather than an ending point. He starts a work that He will finish. Each Christmas, for the past nearly 60 decades, Americans have gathered around the TV to watch one of the most iconic cartoons of all time, A Charlie Brown Christmas. A Charlie Brown Christmas. Now I won't be close with this. And with this, within this iconic show, is one of the most iconic scenes ever scripted. Linus monologue. Do you remember the true meaning of Christmas? Mocked, humiliated, and confused, Charlie Brown cries out, does anybody know what Christmas is all about? And Linus gently replies, I know what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. And with that, he takes center stage to proclaim the good news of the gospel as recorded in Luke chapter 2. Verse 8 says, and, and there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel of the Lord said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be for all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger, and suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace and goodwill toward men. That's what Christmas is about, Charlie Brown. But have you ever noticed what happens right in the middle of the monologue? Linus always carries something around with him, don't he? What's that that he carries? Blanket. It's a blanket, wasn't it? In the middle of the monologue, Linus drops his blanket. Linus is, is most associated with his ever-present security blanket. And throughout the story of Peanuts, Lucy, Snoopy, Sally, and others all work with no avail to separate Linus from his blanket. And even though his security blanket remains a major source of ridicule for the otherwise mature and thoughtful Linus, he simply refuses to give it up until this moment when he drops it. In the in the climatic scene, when Linus shares what Christmas is all about, he drops his security blanket. And I'm now convinced that this is intentional. Most telling is the specific moment that he drops it. It is with the words, fear not. Fear not. Pretty special, isn't it? Special message in there. Because if you believe 
who this Jesus said he was, if you believe that to be true, if you believe that he came to do what he said he was going to do and did just that, and if you believe that you are a child of the living God, then you can toss your blanket to the side too because you don't have anything else to fear. Let's pray together. Our gracious Lord, we thank you for every single blessing. We thank you that you sent your son to die for our sins and to lead us into new life. We thank you for the spirit that you've put upon us. Guide us and lead us and help us to be your disciples in all that we do. Help us to follow you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray and through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um.